Good evening. On behalf of the Allen P. Kirby Center for Free Enterprise and Entrepreneurship, the Wilkes University Enactus team, and the Family Business Alliance of Northeastern Pennsylvania, we welcome the Wilkes-Barre community, friends of the university, trustees, faculty and staff, and most importantly, our students. My name is Bridget Terrell, and I have the privilege of serving as Assistant Director of Leadership Education in the Sidhu School of Business and Leadership here at Wilkes University. The Alan P. Kirby Center for Free Enterprise and Entrepreneurship Lecture Series is intended to bring leading voices on the free enterprise system and entrepreneurship to campus twice a year, once in the fall and once in the spring. Tonight's speaker is a voice who speaks to the future, the landscape of entrepreneurial and societal opportunity. Let me share two quotes our speaker cites in his book, Jump the Curve. The first is from Albert Einstein. Imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited to all we now know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. And from Alvin Tolfer, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. These quotes, particularly the second, suggest that this evening's topic, why future trends will demand unlearning, will be stimulating and a challenge to all of us as teachers, learners, and unlearners. But before we move to the formal introduction of our speaker, we want to acknowledge and thank Mr. Alan P. Kirby, Jr., Mr. Mylan S. Kirby, the Board of Managers of the Alan P. Kirby Center for Free Enterprise and Entrepreneurship, the Family Business Alliance, and Wilkes University for their generous contributions to this lecture series. The Wilkes University Enactus team is providing support for the event. Finally, a word about the format for the lecture. Following the lecture, you will be invited to ask any questions you might have for our guest. Please wait to be recognized before asking your questions. Also, as a courtesy to our guests and the audience, please turn off all cell phones, pagers, laptops, or other mobile devices, and refrain from texting or messaging during the program and postpone use of your cameras until after the lecture. And finally, at the conclusion of the lecture, please do join us in the lobby just outside the theater for a reception, the opportunity to meet our guest, and the opportunity to obtain a personally signed copy of his books. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Christy Spinello, a double major or double major in uh, marketing and business management and also vice president of our Enactus team on campus who will introduce our speaker. Good evening everyone and thank you for coming. It is in my greatest honor to introduce Jack Aldritz, a renowned global futurist independent scholar, sought after business speaker, and best-selling author. He is the author of 11 books and his most recent, Foresight 2020, A Futurist Explores the Trends Transforming Tomorrow, was published in 2012. Jack is the founder and chief unlearning officer of the School of Unlearning, which is an international leadership, change management and technology consultancy dedicated to helping business, governments, and nonprofit organizations prepare for and profit from periods of profound transformation. Highly regarded for his unique ability to present complex information in an entertaining, understandable, and digestible manner that stays with his, long, his audiences long afterwards, Aldrich has spoken to hundreds of businesses and organizations. Jack, who was a former Naval Intelligence Officer and Defense Department official, also served as the Director of the Minnesota Office of Strategic and Long Range Planning under Governor Jesse Ventura. Aldrich is a contributing writer to the Wall Street Journal and The Futurist, 
and made appearances on worldwide media outlets, including CNN and MSNBC. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you, Jack Aldrich. Thanks, Christy. Um, I want to begin my presentation with a quote from Lao Tzu. He's an ancient Chinese philosopher, and thousands of years ago he said, to attain knowledge, add things every day. And I hope in the course of this presentation to add to your knowledge bank. But he went on to say, to attain, to attain wisdom, you have to subtract things every day. And it's my contention that the future that we are all embarked on is going to come at us so fast, but before we can embrace the potential of this new future, we're going to have to let go, subtract, and unlearn some of the things it is we think we know about our world, our industry, our jobs, and even our future. Now, one of the most common questions I get uh, after people have to sit through that uh, long introduction is, well, what is it that a futurist does? And that's a great question, but rather than tell you what a futurist does, I want to show you what a futurist does. And I know that uh, some of you have already seen this video, especially some of your students, but you can still participate in this. And what I'm going to ask you to do is what, oh, sorry, that uh, we went, uh, I hit a little too fast. What I want you to do in this video is count the number of times people in the white shirt pass the basketball. It can either be a bounce pass or a chess pass, and whoever gets the correct answer will get a signed copy of my latest book, Foresight 2020. So does everyone understand what I'm asking? Count the number of times people in the white shirt pass the basketball. Here we go. Okay, could I see your show of hands? How many people counted 15? Okay, some of you, how many people have counted 16? Okay, more of you. What about 17 or some other number? Okay, everyone who said 16, please stand up. 16 is, in fact, the correct answer. Remain standing. Now, unfortunately, I don't have books for all of you, so only the people who are standing can now answer this next question. This will be the tiebreaker. And whomever I see raise their hand first with the correct answer will get the book. So of the people standing, who could identify three other changes in that video? Three changes. Yes, ma'am. The gorilla, congratulations. How many other people saw the gorilla? Okay, so about 30%. So 70% of you didn't even see the gorilla. And two others, ma'am. Two other changes. Uh, what was that? Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, sir, in the back, did you see all three? Only two. All right, well, I tell you what, I will, uh, I will still give you the book, although you didn't technically meet it. Uh, you had to see all three, if you could pass that back. Uh, I'm now going to show you what all of you missed. Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. All right, so the curtain was a little hard to see in this light, so I'll, uh, maybe I should have given you the book, the gentleman who saw it, too. But again, I told you I was going to show you what a futurist does. Look, I gave all of you an incentive to focus on a very specific task. And often in your day-to-day -day jobs, you're similarly incented, and you're just focused on whatever your specific job or responsibility is. But as a futurist, I have the luxury of stepping back and looking at the big picture. And the first thing I like to remind my audience is this. There's this 800-pound gorilla in the form of new emerging technologies that's walked front and center into our lives. It's beating its chest, saying, I'm going to transform virtually every aspect of your life. But most of us don't see it because our attention is focused elsewhere. But beyond that, certain jobs and industries are fading away. It's kind of like the person in the black shirt just walking away. We don't pick up on these. But even more difficult than that is human behavior. Customer behavior is changing in some subtle ways. It's like the curtain changing colors. And we don't see these changes because that's not where our attention is focused. But what I want to do in this presentation is just first just help you see how fast your world is changing. 
But the other thing I want to do is I want to help you think like a futurist. And this is the theme of a book I wrote a couple years ago called Jump the Curve. And when I wrote this book, I came across uh, a couple of quotes from Albert Einstein, but there's one that I particularly like. And he said years ago to scientists and technologists, he said, if you can't explain what you're working on to a six-year-old child, you're a fraud. I thought, wow, that's a really good test. Just so happens when the book came out, my son Sean was only six years old, and I wanted to see if he could grasp what I meant by jump the curve, because I need you to grasp this concept. And I didn't know how to do it, but one day he came to me, he was very excited, he'd lost his first tooth. And I thought, oh, I'm going to teach my son how to jump the curve. So I said to him, imagine the Tooth Fairy comes this evening and presents you with two different options for your teeth. And it is a fact that all babies have 20 teeth. Option number one, Tooth Fairy's going to give you $5 per tooth. His eyes get really big. I'm kind of a cheap guy. I said, look, son, this is just a hypothetical example. I'm not telling you Tooth Fairy is necessarily going to bring you that. But that's one option, $5 for 20 tooth. Or the second option is a penny for the first tooth, two for the second, four for the third. That penny doubles 20 times. Which option are you taking? Without batting an eye, he goes, I'm taking the $5, Dad. That'd be $100 in total. I go, okay, fair enough. But do you actually know what your 20th tooth would have been worth under the other option? Sheepishly, he says no. I go, well, as your dad, I'm about to tell you. It would have been worth $5,242.88. To which he promptly says, no way. And as any good parent, I said, yes way. Uh, but then I said, look, son, let's uh, plot that out on a graph, the doubling of the penny. Early on, it looks insignificant. One penny, two, four. It doesn't really look like it's going anywhere. But after just 20 doublings, that curve shoots up to over $5,000. That's why he, if he wanted to understand the, tooth, the implications of the Tooth Fairy's offer, he would have had to jump that curve to understand that's where exponential growth was headed. That's why he needed to know how to do it. The reason you need to know how to jump the curve is because there are now 10 technological forces that are doubling anywhere from every four to 24 months. It is computer processing power. It is data storage. It is bandwidth. It's the sequencing of genes. It's advances in biotechnology, nanotechnology, robotics, 3D printing, sensor technology, and the collection of data. All of these trends aren't just creeping up linearly. They're shooting up exponentially. So the first thing we have to recognize, folks, is we're just at the flat part of this curve today. Where we're headed in the not-too-distant future is a decidedly different place. We all have to jump this curve. And now, one of the points I want to make clear from this point forward, every technology I'm about to tell you about isn't off in the future. Everything I tell you about is here today. Your challenge is to understand how each and every one of these is getting exponentially more powerful. So let me just quickly walk you through the 10 trends that are going to transform tomorrow. First one, wearable technology. How many of you know what this technology is, the picture of? It's Google Glass. These are glasses that you wear, and it is as though the computer screen is right in front of your eye. This is going to be a commercial product sometime this year, in 2014. But let me show you where we already are with this technology. At Ohio State University, just two months ago, the world's first surgeon wore the device, and here's what he is able to do. As Oops. Sorry, let's see if we can do that again. As Kading performed surgery on the east side of Columbus, a colleague collaborated from his office across town. And on Ohio State's main campus, a group of medical students saw this historic event from a completely different perspective. So that's where we were at the end of 2013. Specialists are already collaborating with specialists on the other side of town. There's no reason why we can't collaborate with specialists on the other side of the world. It's transforming medical education today. But again, your challenge is to understand how this technology is only going to get better, faster, and more affordable. And might it suddenly start transforming all levels of education and other aspects of business? Absolutely. How you communicate with your customers and your colleagues in the not too distant future might change as a result of this technology. Because watch what else the students are able to do with it. A surgeon could potentially call up x-rays or MRI images of the patient, pathology reports, and reference material. The doctor can even talk live to colleagues or specialists via the internet anywhere in the world. So again, that's where we already are, but I'm not sure how many of you saw just three weeks ago, what's, what else is Google working on? It's another uh, wearable technology. I thought I had the slide in here. It's a brand new contact 
lens that does what? It monitors, if you're a diabetic, it monitors your glucose level and it's going to be able to help them better manage diabetes. Wearable technology is absolutely taking off. Trend number two that is doubling, 3D manufacturing. How many of you know what 3D manufacturing is? This is the printing out of physical objects. And this field is absolutely exploding. I just came across this video just today. This is what they're already able to do in uh, the Netherlands, uh, building new metal materials, printing, if you will, new metal materials. So that looks like a piece of rebar, but we can also have different form factors. But of course, it's not going to stop there. It might interest you to know that we have already printed out all of the exterior components of an automobile up in Winnipeg, Canada. What else is happening? By 2017, General Electric has said they're going to be printing aircraft engine parts. So in just three years. So think, what does this mean for the future of manufacturing? Instead of producing many items over in China or over in Asia, producing them over there, putting them on a ship, transporting them across the Pacific Ocean, bringing them into Long Beach, putting them on a truck and delivering them to some place in Pennsylvania, what happens to the future of manufacturing when we can print a lot of components right in people's backyards? In-house. It could absolutely man revolutionize manufacturing, and it can bring manufacturing jobs back to America. Here's another way I want you to think about the future is if something doubles just 10 times, it's not 10 times as big, it's a thousand times as big. So my son's 10th tooth under that penny doubling, $5.12. But just 10 doublings later, it goes from $5 to over 5,000, thousand fold increase. Well, a lot of people say to me, oh, Jack, we're not going to see thousand fold increase in anything anytime soon. I go, you know what, before I talk to you about the future, let's just walk back 15 years. Fifteen years ago, Google was just two guys with three computers. Today, I think most of us would agree it's a pretty impressive organization that has transformed media, advertising, education, moving into healthcare, moving into energy demand management, even moving into transportation. That company has experienced more than a thousand-fold increase. Wikipedia is another great example. Didn't even exist ten years ago. Started out with one person putting his knowledge online. It's like, who cares about what one person Thanks. Well, Jimmy Wales did it, got another thousand people to do it. We still didn't care. Then another thousand fold increase. Today, millions of people are freely contributing to Wikipedia, and we've created an encyclopedia that is just as accurate as Encyclopedia Britannica, but it's doubling every other year, and it's now available in 263 different languages, just in the last 10 years. So as I was writing uh, my next book, I decided to put this idea of Google or exponential growth into Google, didn't exist 15 years ago, very first entry that pops up is Wikipedia, didn't exist 10 years ago, and then there is this bizarre word, zenzizenzizenzit. I go, what the hell is that? Any of you happen to know? It is a word that is 400 years old, but it means two to the eighth power, something that doubles eight times. And I thought, oh, that's pretty close to what I'm trying to tell people is coming. Maybe not every one of those 10 technologies I rattled off is going to double 10 times. Uh, so we won't see thousand-fold increase in everything, but everyone's going to double at least eight times. Now, I suspect that some of you are looking at that word going, I'll never remember it, and it has no practical bearing on me, my business, or my life. And I'd beg to differ, and here's why. Just last year, Cisco came out and said that mobile web video is going to explode 250-fold in the next two years. That, my friends, is a zen zizen zizen zik like transformation coming our way. Well, what might this mean? Well, here's where we have to jump the curve, but here's one way I want you to think about it. Uh, how many of you have seen, right in Philadelphia, there are now virtual grocery stores? Have any of you seen this at some of the subway stops? A few of you have. So commuters get off in the morning, and with their smartphone, they can literally grocery shop press an app on their phone, and it transmits it to Peapod's warehouse, and the groceries are delivered to the home or apartment by the end of the day. That's how the retail industry is exploiting mobile web video communication to do what? To reach out to existing customers in new innovative ways, and maybe reach new customers in some really innovative ways. 
So the question you have to ask is, how might you be able to do some things differently with this technology that we know is going to explode 250-fold in the next couple of years? If you're in the education field, there's some universities who are already figuring out how to bring the classroom exactly to the student wherever the student is. Instead of making the student come to the building, why don't we use this technology to bring the classroom to the student wherever he or she is living? Uh, because I know it's been a long day for a lot of you, and because it's a university setting, I'm going to keep peppering you with some questions. Uh, who could tell me there's a mathematical relationship between all these numbers? 1,000 million, billion, trillion. Does anyone know the mathematical relationship? Yes, sir. It increases, uh, yeah, a thousand-fold. That is absolutely right. Congratulations. Each one is a thousand times bigger. And remember, I said if something doubles ten times, how much bigger is it? It's a thousand times bigger. So if there is a technology that is doubling ten times, and let's say we're only in the thousands today, but it's doubling, that means we're going to go to the millions. If we're in the millions, we're going to go to the billions. If we're in the billions, we're going to go to the trillions. And I am now going to walk you through some thousand-fold increases that are coming our way. But before I do that, let's just step back six years. Six years ago, how many of us knew what apps were? None of us did because they did not exist. Um, and today, it, uh, it's a $25 billion a year industry, employs half a million people, but didn't even exist a couple of years ago. Well, uh, for some of you who are uh, my age, here's an interesting way I want you to think about how fast the world is changing. I'm almost 50 years old, and if any of you are my age, back in the day when we'd go to a concert and we wanted to bring out the artist back for an encore, what would some of us do? Woo, that's right. We'd hold up a lighter, say, come back out. Well, uh, my kids are now teenagers, but when they were very young, my wife and I didn't go to a concert for 10 years. We went to one two summers ago, and the big difference was what? Uh, younger people were holding up. Yeah, cell phones. I go, oh, that's a curious difference. And then we went back to another one uh, just a couple of months ago, and the young gentleman next to me had downloaded a Zippo lighter app on his phone, and he flicked it, and he lit it, and he was like, woohoo, come back out. And uh, I looked over, and I thought, well, that's just weird. But then I thought, no, that's a great metaphor for the future. Look, we're still going to do the same things we have always done. We're still going to grocery shop. We're still going to visit doctors. We're still going to get educated. But how some of us do some of these things might change as a result of some of these tools. So when we see these curiosities, instead of dismissing them, say, oh, might they be a hint towards where the future is headed? And in many cases, I think the answer is yes, because this future, just in apps, is coming fast. How many of you saw the news just a couple days ago? Facebook, for $19 billion, bought a company that didn't even exist in 2009. Look at They went from zero users to over 4 million faster than any company has ever happened. And this is happening on an increasingly frequent basis. I don't know what's after WhatsApp, but something else is coming. Because before it, it was Facebook. And before that, it was Twitter. The world is moving at warp speed. And let me just stick with apps for a moment. Let me just show you where we are in the world of apps uh, today. This is about uh, a year old now, but it's, it's just come on the market. So, uh, an impressive app. That's what he right? does with his cell phone. And, and we'll just pop this iPhone into it like that. He shows how simply his modified yeah. iPhone produces a cardiogram for a patient. So you, got, you just put your fingers on it. There you go. And in a second, wow. you know, in the first second, then it stabilizes. There it is. The device was approved by the FDA in December and is now sold to physicians for $199. $199. It might interest you to know that an electrocardiogram machine today in a hospital costs about $30,000. And if you or a loved one has a heart condition and you have to go see that heart specialist, on average it costs you or your insurance company about $700. And yet here's one low-cost app that is fundamentally transforming that market. You want to talk about the power of entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurs of the world are the ones who are ultimately going to solve the health care crisis in this country because they're going to figure out how to deliver low-cost preventative medicine where the previous system has not been able to do that. This is just the start. These tools are growing exponentially better, and there are going to be more and more of them. But now I do want to walk you into the future and start talking about some technologies where we're going to see thousand-fold increase. 
I've written a couple of books on nanotechnology. I'm not going to bore you with it, uh, the technical details, but here's how I want you to think about it. A couple of years ago, uh, nanotechnology enhanced products, primarily in the form of stain resistant clothing, was a $100 million a year industry. Today, it's a $10 billion a year industry. And how many of you saw the new uh, Samsung phone that was introduced just two months ago? It has a new self repairing nano material in it. So if you scratch it, it just repairs itself on its own. In their video. Whoops, sorry. Ah, sorry. That's what he in their video, they scratch the phone up and down on the back next to a regular backing. Then after two minutes of sitting, the G-Flex actually completely heals, almost, while the regular phone is, of course, still scratched. Now, the So we already have self-repairing materials. So it's, a, as I said, a $10 billion a year industry. By 2020, nano-enhanced products are expected to be a $100 billion a year global industry. It's another one of these thousand-fold increases that's walking right through our lives, but most of us don't see it. Let me show you where we are headed. Uh, there's a new nanomaterial called graphene that was discovered just 10 years ago, and here's what we can do with it today. And he just turned it on with this little piece of graphene. But the amazing thing is, it doesn't stop working. After charging for two or three seconds, he ran this light for over five minutes. I thought we have something very important. I, I thought the world changed at that point. He thought the world would change. As I said, I've written a couple of books on nanotechnology. You go, what is he talking about? That doesn't seem that transformative to me. Well, to his great credit and to my great shame, he's jumped the curve because here's what he thinks might be possible with graphene in just the next couple of years. It's like electric vehicles. Now you pull into a gas station. Well, you'd pull into a charging station, and within a minute, it would charge up your car. What if you could charge up an electric vehicle not in four hours, but in less than 30 seconds? Is that a game-changing technology that the automotive industry might want to be aware of, and might it change our world faster than most people appreciate? Absolutely. I don't want to say that this future will necessarily come to fruition, but do we have to be aware of it? Absolutely, because the world is changing at warp speed. Trend number five, another thousand-fold increase. The number of robots that are being deployed on battlefields, in hospitals, on, in, on farms is doubling. Today, the base is around thousands of robotic devices, but the number's doubling every year, and it's going to double for the next 10 years, so we're going to go from thousands to millions of robots. How many of you know what this robot is? It's called Baxter. It's now available for $22,000, and it's being used by small and medium-sized manufacturers right here in Pennsylvania to do what? to stay competitive with low-cost labor abroad. A lot of people tend to think, oh, robotic technology is going to put everyone out of work. Well, that's not happening, at least today. In many cases, robotic technology is being used by companies to stay competitive and to employ more people. But of course, it's not going to stop there. How many of you saw 60 Minutes right before the holidays this past year? Amazon is experimenting with drone technology to make deliveries. Oops, sorry, but this is a very sensitive clicker I have. So maybe you won't have to go to the pharmacy in a couple of years. You can just have your prescription filled and uh, delivered right to you. And if you think that this is a, a ways off, just two weeks ago, the government in Dubai said we're going to start delivering government documents, driver's license, others using drone technology. This technology, again, is here today, but like many of these others, it's only going to get exponentially better, more affordable. It might be here sooner rather than later. How many of you know what this technology is? Some of you? It is Google's, what is it? Uh, uh, it's not, uh, it, it's Google's self-driven car. It's using the, uh, the mapping technology. It's already legal in California, Florida, and Nevada. It's legal in those three states. Why is that? It's because Google's self-driven robotic technology is so good that on over a million miles of California freeways and roads has not yet gotten in an accident. I recently came across this video. This is someone getting into a self-driven car. For the first time, I thought it was interesting. I think you might get a kick out of it as well. What? It's driving itself. <laughs> ah! Ah! <laughs> 
I show you that because in many ways I think that's exactly what the future is going to feel like to all of us. Just downright frightening at how fast it is coming. But here's how I want you to think a little bit differently about the future. I suspect that some of you are going, well, there's no way I'm going to give up control of the steering wheel. And you know what? You might not. But I think that there are two big demographic groups who will. First, young people who've never learned to drive in the first place. First, I would argue many of them aren't paying attention to the dang road anyways and would probably benefit from self-driven technology. But what other group might really benefit from this technology? The elderly. That's right. Often they lose their last link to independence. Why they often have to go into an assisted li living facility is because they can no longer drive. So suddenly, again, I don't want to say that all of our parents, our grandparents, will necessarily warm to this technology. But if given the choice, some of them might. And they might, it might be the seniors who push this technology forward. And we have to be open to how the future might unfold in some unexpected ways. And if you're an entrepreneur, the one thing you can't afford to do is put your biases on others, because other people are going to react to these technologies in ways that are different than yourself. Trend number six th that is doubling, only this time we're going to go from millions to billions, is the number of sensors, computer chips, radio frequency identification tags we are putting on our environment is doubling. And we're going to go from millions to billions. How many of you already wear a Fitbit, a Nike Fuel Band, or a Jawbone? Any of you? So a couple of you do. These are bands that have sensor technology in them, and they essentially connect your physical activity to the internet. By 2020, there are going to be 50 billion objects, physical objects, connected to the internet. And this is going to be. Um, I'm going to skip over this video. The FDA. Uh, this is going to be referred to as the Internet of Things. And a couple of companies are saying this is anywhere from a 15 to $30 trillion business opportunity uh, in the coming decade. So what does connecting physical objects to the Internet mean? Well, Cisco recently began airing this commercial trying to understand or help the public understand what's coming. It'll give you a glimpse into the Internet of things. Trees will talk to networks. We'll talk to scientists about climate change. Cars will talk to road sensors. We'll talk to stoplights about traffic efficiency. The ambulance will talk to patient records. We'll talk to doctors about saving lives. It's going to be amazing, and exciting, and maybe, most remarkably, not that far away. Not that far away. Any of you who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs, there's a 15 to $30 trillion business opportunity that is just waiting for innovative minds to approach it. Um, trend number seven that is doubling, only this time we're going to go from billions to trillions, is gene sequencing technology. And here's how I want you to think about this, is that seven years ago, if you wanted to sequence your genome, you wouldn't have been able to do it, because it cost $150 million. Craig Venter, a billionaire, could afford it. He did it, and that's exactly what it cost him. But gene sequencing technology, getting better every four months, which means the price is being cut in half every four months. And if you cut $150 million in half every four months, something truly remarkable happens. And it follows this downward trajectory perfectly. By the end of 2012, the price had dropped to $10,000. By the end of last year, December 2013, less than $1,000. But get ready for this. By 2020, it's going to be more expensive for you to flush your toilet than it is to sequence your genome. What seven years ago cost $150 million is going to be reduced to pennies. That is extraordinary. But what does this mean? Well, let me just give you one uh, contemporary example. How many of you remember the news from last summer when Angelie Jolie announced that she was going to have a double mastectomy? Any of you remember that? And why did she do that? It's because she had her gene, genome sequenced and that information told her that she had an 87% chance of getting breast cancer. And she said, that's a risk I don't want to take. My point is, as more and more of you have your genes sequenced, we're going to be able to figure out 
what future ailments you might have, the cancers, the diseases that you might have, and then we'll be able to prevent you from ever having those in the first place. Because this field is exploding. Just last week, a new technology was developed or announced that says that we can now essentially begin inserting the correct genes into people's DNA when they have defective genes. Trend number eight, doubling computer processing power. And I like to mention this one because a lot of us like to think because we have laptops and desktops and smartphones that we've lived through the computer revolution. Uh, 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 uh. We're about a fraction of the way through the computer revolution. And here's how I want you to uh, think about it. How many of you remember Jeopardy uh, now three years ago when IBM's supercomputer Watson went on, crushed Ken Jennings, the all-time human champion, wasn't really even a contest. And that was a couple of years ago, but we've gone from trivial game shows to some pretty serious stuff. Uh, just over in uh, New York City at Sloan Kettering, I believe that's where Sloan Kettering is, they hired Watson last year, and here's what Watson can, is already doing. Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and IBM are at the forefront in building new technology that will use IBM Watson and complex analytics to better treat cancer patients. With medical information doubling every five years, finding new ways to make evidence-based decisions has never been more critical. So that's pretty impressive. I, th I hope that most of us can agree that, look, if a machine can better, faster, more accurately, and more affordably diagnose your cancer, it's the right thing to allow the technology to do that. But now I don't want to leave you with the impression that this technology is suddenly going to put all sorts of cancer specialists and oncologists out of work. I don't think that that's what's going to happen. If technology can do something better, let's allow technology to do that. And then counterintuitively, that then allows the specialist to do what? To spend more time interacting with the patient, helping him or her understand their disease. In many ways, technology is going to allow us to get back to the more human elements of our jobs, the things that we do really well. But of course, the computer revolution isn't going to stop there. Uh, here's how I want you to think about this. Could I just see a show of hands? How many of you now have on your possession the, the now tragically outdated iPhone 4S? Some of you still have that? Okay, some of you do. And it just came out 18 months ago. But 18 months ago, the latest, greatest advance on the iPhone 4S was what? It was Siri. That's right, artificial intelligence. You can now ask your phone a question, and it gives you an answer back. It does a pretty good job, but it still makes a few silly mistakes. What we have to appreciate is the processing power and the algorithms behind Siri or Google Now are going to get potentially a thousand times more powerful in the coming decade. So what does this mean? Well, here's what it might mean. It might mean we're moving from a world where we ask our phones questions and get answers to a world where our phones and our devices know us so well that they tell us things we need to know before we even know to ask the question. And if you don't believe that, watch this. This comes from the same fellow who has developed the $199 app. Here's what he's working on next. What could this tell me about impending trouble? Well, we're working on a project that will take a nanosensor in the bloodstream that is smaller than a grain of sand, and it will, it will pick up a signal when you have cells that are coming off shed from the, into the bloodstream coming off from the artery lining, which is a precursor to a heart attack. And then you will get on your phone a special heart attack ringtone. A special heart attack ringtone. Now, now I don't know about you, but if I get that damn ring, I'm probably going to have a heart attack. But, but my point is, doesn't that sound a little outlandish? And it might, from your per perspective today, but his understanding of advances in nanotechnology, nanoscience, computer processing, power sensor technology, tell him that that vision isn't way off in the far, far future. It's just a couple of years away. He has jumped the curve, and this future is coming at us very, very fast. So and now I want to transition a little bit into the unlearning aspect, and I like to set it up with this question. As soon as you 
recognize what's wrong with this card, raise your hand. Don't shout out the answer, just uh, raise the hand. Okay, I can tell some of you who go to the casino regularly. No, I'm just kidding, I don't know that. Uh, but keep looking at it, and there's something blatantly, patently wrong with it. And raise your hand when you recognize it. Uh, in the interest of time, tell me what it is, sir. Uh, That's right, it's a spade. It should be black, but it's red. But here's what's really curious. For 95, most people, it takes over a minute to recognize that's what's wrong with it. But here's what's curious. If before I ever put that photo up and I just came up to you and said, would you recognize a red spade? Most people quite confidently go, oh yeah, that'd be so weird, I'd pick up on it instantly. But that's not what happens for the overwhelming majority of you. And here's why. When our way of viewing the world has been so conditioned to see something one way, we've always seen spades as black, even after that world changes, so powerful is that old way of thinking that we don't even see the new change. The metaphor is this, folks. Your world has already changed. And it is as odd as a red spade, and you might not be seeing it yet. But you have to become aware of these changes because they're occurring all around us. And let me just give you one example of a change that uh, is happening around us. I came across this video about a year ago. Let me just set it up by saying that this young child is 11 months old. I'm going to show you the video clip, and then I'm going to tell you why I found it so interesting. So you're looking at it, and she's, she's saying to herself, well, my finger works. Mm, whatever, whatever that thing is, it's not doing it for her. She's given an iPad, and she's immediately happy. Now, when I saw this, my jaw hit the ground, and here's why. Here's an 11-month-old child who's growing up in a world where she expects what? She expects to interact with information. And if it doesn't interact back with her, she's not doing business with it. These are your future customers. These are your future coworkers. These are your kids and grandkids today. The world is changing. Here's the one thing that we can't do. We can't be like grandpa in this particular video. I think you'll get the metaphor. From the what not to do with an iPad file comes this German clip. <laughs> Never mind watching young children with expensive toys. This is a convincing argument to watch anyone who thinks wireless is still another word for radio. All right, so I think we can all agree we don't want to, we don't want to be like uh, Grandpa in that uh, particular video. But let me give you a more concrete example, and this is another trend that is doubling. The amount of data that we are collecting is absolutely skyrocketing, and it's leading to the field of big data, call it data mining, business analytics, call it whatever you want, but let me show you what some of the companies who really understand this trend are doing. And Amazon is just one example. They now collect so much information on you, your shopping behavior, your purchasing history. They can tell a lot about you, and here's their long-term vision. Anything you want on, on Earth, you're going to get from us. Anything you want on Earth, you're going to get from us. That's where we're headed, I believe. The rules are changing. If you're at all in retail, your new competitors are not just Amazon, but any other company that is using big data because they're using it to better understand your customers. And if you don't understand your customers as well as they do, you're going to lose out to them. Another example of a company who is uh, all involved in big data is Google. How many of you saw the news? Just a couple months ago, they started a new health and wellness company. It's called Calico. And it's all about using information that you're already providing to keep you healthier. And Google is interested in trying to find a business model where they get paid to keep you healthy. Think about that. We're moving from a world where we wait till you get sick and then we treat you to a world where the smart companies are going to figure out how to get some money from you to help you stay well. And I'd argue that's what all of us want. We want to stay healthy in the first place. 
Now, as the world is changing, and we know we need to uh, unlearn, uh, but no, I guess not everyone is convinced that they need to unlearn, and I, hopefully I'm going to uh, prove that uh, some of you do need to unlearn, and I have a very simple question, and now what I want you to do is I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what two colors the yield sign is. Go ahead. T tell your neighbor what two colors the yield sign is. Okay, so... Uh, those of you who said yellow and black, uh, congratulations. Uh, that was the correct answer up until 1971. The yield sign has been red and white since Richard Nixon was the President of the United States. I'm sure some of you are going, no way, that is, that is not true. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, it is true. The first yield sign you see after leaving the auditorium will be red and white. And curiously enough, every other one all the way home will be red and white. Inevitably, I know someone will want to come up to me afterwards and say, Jack, you just don't understand this rural area. There are still some yellow and black yield signs out here. No, there are not. There are no yellow and black yield signs anywhere. I've been doing this for years. And don't hang your hat on that somehow your local community is unique and still has. Yellow, they don't. Uh, but to me, this is a really powerful metaphor for a lot of people. And here's why. And here's, here's the analogy. is that Look, it is a fact that years ago, yield signs were yellow and black. The problem is that old, crappy information has just stayed stuck in our head, even in the face of overwhelming visual evidence to the contrary. We've been driving by these signs dozens of times a day for decades, and it hasn't registered. The metaphor is this. There are certain things, and I can't tell you what they are, but there are certain things that you learned in school years ago or early in your career that, yes, they were true yesterday, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily true today. So here's what I want you to do if you got this question wrong. What I'd like you to do is this. Uh, the next time uh, you see a red and white yield sign, uh, which will be the next time you see a yield sign, I just want you to think to yourself, how is my world changing, and I'm just not seeing it. If nothing else, use this as a reminder that we all have to stay humble. Not everything that sits in our head is necessarily true. Now, uh, those of you who said yellow and black, I am not done with you yet. Uh, if you're a little curious as to what your brain looks like, here's what your brain kind of looks like. That's what your brain kind of <laughs> looks like. So it looked good back in the day, but I think it's time for a little mental wardrobe update. So that's a, that's a light-hearted example, but let me just uh, relate this to something a little more relevant. I talk to a lot of people my age, and I talk to them about social media, and frequently the gist of the conversation is, ah, social, social media, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all of these things, they're just a colossal waste of time. Why are people tweeting what they had for breakfast? You know, all of these sites, they should just merge into one super time-wasting website called You Twit Face. It's like, I don't have time. I'm a busy... Profession, I don't have time for this nonsense. And if that is your impression of social media, I suggest you might need to unlearn a few things. And by way of visual metaphor, I'm going to take you back about uh, 25 years now. And uh, this fellow was given a then new technology. He thought he understood how to use it, but let's watch what happens. Look, if you, if you don't understand a new technology, you might mistreat it. If that one doesn't work for you, let's go a little further back in history and watch what happens with, uh, with this technology. <laughs> so my point is this. People who are still saying social media is this colossal waste of time are looking at this new tool and just doing the metaphorical equivalent of dismissing this powerful new tool. I mean, its ability to help reach out to new customers, to educate, to help people engage in better health care, virtually whatever industry you're in, social media has a role to play. But many people, because they grew up in a different era, don't see these opportunities. But if you're not, some of you might have to unlearn some of your assumptions about these new tools. 
Now, let me just uh, delve a little bit deeper into unlearning and uh, try and relate a couple of these things about both uh, awareness and humility. So what I want everyone to do is stand up. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to test your mental and your physical flexibility. So I want everyone to watch me as closely as possible and do exactly as I do, okay? So everyone put your hands up. Put your hands out a little bit. Clap them together. <laughs> Flip your hands over. Everyone take your right hand, put it over your left, and then your right thumb under your left. So, okay, everyone, this is your right hand. Okay, got it. Uh, and now, if you are sufficiently flexible, interlace and interlock those fingers, okay? Now lower your hands a little bit. Now, if you're even more dexterous, I want you to tap those index fingers together, okay? Now, does everyone promise they were watching closely? Because if everyone was watching closely, every single one of you should be able to quickly, simply, and elegantly, and without rotating your shoulders at all, rotate those fingers 180 degrees to the top. How many of you can do that simple, elegant motion? Or are many of you somehow suspiciously locked up? It's like, uh, uh, what? All right, have a seat. I'm going to show you what just happened. Uh, and I know if I don't, if I don't show you, half of you are going to be under the, the chairs for the next couple of minutes. Like, how the hell did that guy do that? Uh, here's the trick, but it has a metaphor to it. Uh, so you, and you can go back and do this with your friends, your colleagues, your, your family later. Say, watch me as closely as possible and do exactly as I do. Put your hands up. Put your hands out. Clap them together. Flip them over. Everyone take your right hand. Put it over your left. And everyone does that right, but even if they do it right, here comes the trick. You go, no, no, your right hand. You distract everyone's attention. That gives you the opportunity to flip your hand that way. Very few people see it. Uh, it then allows you to do that, but because other people don't see it, they're like, hey, do that again. And they still don't see it the second time. But, uh, but here's the metaphor, is that I'm hoping after this presentation, you're going to say, well, that was a good presentation. That opened my mind to how the world is changing. I fear, however, what's going to happen is all of you, most of you are going to go right back to your day-to-day -day jobs or your lives, and you're going to focus on what you have always focused on. What I'm trying to tell you is that your world is changing constantly. And if you don't pick up on these changes, if you don't give yourself permission on a regular basis to step back, to read, to think about how your world is changing, if you don't pick up on those changes, what's going to happen? you're going to end up locked up. But if you do give yourself permission to see those changes, think about them, reflect on them, you're going to be flexible, adaptable enough to steer yourself, your company, and your family into the future. So give yourself permission to just step back and think and reflect on how the world is changing. And one of the things I think we should all do is give ourselves a think week. Literally take a week just to read some different books or reflect on how the world is changing. And as I told some of the students today, I, I, I suspect I can already hear what some of you are saying in your head. It's like, who does this guy think he is? How am I going to find a week to think? But then I want you to think about that statement. What you are essentially saying is if you don't have time a week, you can't find 2% of your time to think about the future. Well, who exactly is thinking about the future then. And if a week is too much, I don't care how you break it down, do an hour a week, 12 minutes a day. I don't care how you break it down, but give yourself permission to unplug, to step away, and reflect on how the world is changing, because that, more than anything else, is going to help you see, become aware of where the future is changing, and it might help you identify some of the areas where you need to unlearn. And let me just give you two quick resources. On a regular basis, I read MIT's technology review on a daily basis, free. They'll send you three to five articles about how fast the world is changing and what's coming next. If that's too much, some of you hopefully are familiar with the British publication, The Economist. Four times a year, they come out with an edition called the Technology Quarterly Review. And for my money, they do the best job, their writers and their editors, looking over the near-term horizon saying, here's what's coming, here's what we all need to be thinking about. So if nothing else, use those two uh, resources. And let me just give you an example from my last 
think week, that uh, up until a couple of months ago, I wasn't aware of Project Loon. Are any of you familiar with this? It's Google's uh, new sort of, uh, it's a moonshot project, but essentially they're using high altitude balloons and they hope to deliver high speed internet access to all seven billion people on the planet within just the next couple of years. If that works, suddenly, what does that mean? Any of you who are entrepreneurs, five billion new potential customers come online. They might not necessarily have a lot of money, but your product or technology might not need to make a lot of money per customer if you suddenly have billions of people who are the potential market. Reflect on these changes because they're happening everywhere. Uh, here's another way I think a lot of you can future-proof yourself and uh, be open to the idea of unlearning. I'm going to show you a little video clip here, and what I want you to do is I want you to tell me which way you see the dancer spinning. And I'm going to tell you why I'm showing you this in a minute. Could I see a show of hands? How many of you see the dancer spinning clockwise? Okay, some of you. How many of you see her spinning counterclockwise? Some of you. How many of you have actually been able to see her spin both directions at the same time? This is a mind blow. She's actually spinning both directions at the same time. This took me five weeks to see, and if you can't see it, it's going to drive you crazy. Every day for five weeks, I went back to this website. It's like, nope, nope, she's still just one way. Uh, finally, I saw it, and it's similarly going to drive you crazy if you can't see it. So I'm going to uh, relieve you of that burden. But I am going to help you scratch this intellectual itch. And here's how I'm going to do it. It's often been said that if something looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it, it is a duck. And undoubtedly, you will all see a, uh, hopefully, a duck there. But what else do you see? A rabbit. And if you can't see a rabbit, I can't help you. No, I'm just kidding. If you can't see a rabbit yet, instead of envisioning a duck's bill, think of those as ears, and then the creature's looking off in the other way. So hopefully, most of you can now toggle your brain back and forth. One second, it's a duck. The next, it's a rabbit. The picture is not changing, it's your brain that's changing. And that exact same phenomenon is happening with the spinning dancer. And I'll make this presentation available to whoever wants it. You can put it up on the, the website so you can all look at these uh, illusions. But uh, the metaphor is this. It is a couple of years ago, and the reason I'm showing you these pictures, a couple of years ago the American Management Association looked at successful leaders. Entrepreneurial leaders, business leaders, government leaders, non-for-profit leaders, educational leaders. And one characteristic rose to the top, what made a good leader. Do you know what it was? It was a leader's ability to embrace ambiguity. Often we fall prey to the idea that the world is black or white. It's a duck or a rabbit. She's spinning this way or that way. The world and the future, if anything, are only going to be more ambiguous. And if you want to prosper in the future, Instead of trying to shut out ambiguity and look for simplicity, embrace ambiguity. Because if you can see both sides or the multiple sides of different things, you're going to be more likely to position yourself to exploit opportunities where others can't. Uh, and here's just one way I want you to embrace uh, ambiguity. There's a lot of people who fear technology and think that technology is going to put all of us out of work. And I think we just have to do a better job of embracing ambiguity. And here's how I want you to think about this. How many of you remember about a decade and a half ago when IBM's supercomputer beat the world's best chess player? Any of you remember that, Big Blue? And people said, that's it. Computer will always be able to beat a human, the world's best chess player. And that's true. Computers have only gotten 1,000 times more powerful. But you know what can beat the world's most powerful supercomputer? A human working with other low-level computers can actually beat the world's most powerful computer. And I think it's this amb ambiguity of embracing human potential and creativity and ingenuity and matching it with technology that's actually going to help all of us get to a new, better level. So rather than fear technology, I hope most of you will embrace it as a tool to do what we're already doing, but to do it better, faster, and more affordably. Uh, Another thing I encourage all of you to do to, uh, to unlearn is um, 
to get a reverse mentor. A lot of us who are older, we're used to the idea of a mentor being older and more experienced. And that's entirely appropriate. But in this new world, I think a lot of us on this side of the room have to look over to the students and say, can you mentor me? And why is that? It's because they understand these tools, they see the world differently, and we can learn from them and unlearn from them, and they can also learn and unlearn from us. Uh, so let me just uh, wrap up everything and try and tie everything together, and I'm going to give away another book, but I'm going to ask another question here. And so whoever gets this question will get a copy of my book, Higher Unlearning. So here's the question. I want all of you to picture a lake that you're familiar with. The lake can be any size, but let's just say it's the first day of, because this winter has been interminably long, let's just say it's June, and there is a single lily pad on this lake. But if you're thinking of a big lake, the lily pad will be bigger. If it's a small lake, the lily pad will be smaller. But every day in June, that lily pad doubles. Okay? So on day two, there are two. Day three, there are four. Next day, eight, 16. Uh, 16, there we go, 32. 64 keeps doubling until June 30th. And then on June 30th, the entire lake is covered. So can everyone kind of picture that exponential growth? So here's the... Here's the question. On day 20, and I'll give the book to whoever gets the answer within one percentage point. On day 20, what percentage of the lake is covered? First, I just want all of you to think of your answer. And then uh, if you have a, uh, a guess, feel free to shout it out. Or if you think you know the answer. 100% no? 70 no? This young gentleman up here. Yes. That is, that is within one percentage point. He said 0.02. The closer answer is uh, 0.01, but you are well within the realm. And uh, sorry, I went a little fast. but uh, So it's one-tenth of one percent. And I'll give you the book. Uh, congratulations. But a lot of people go, what? One-tenth of one percent? That doesn't make any sense. You've just spent the last... 45 minutes telling me how fast exponential growth is growing, and you're telling me the lily pads just cover one-tenth of one percent? Yes. In fact, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. Because what else did I tell you? If something doubles just 10 more times, and that's what's going to happen from day 20 to day 30, how much bigger does it get? A thousand times bigger. So by day 25, we're still just a little over 3. It's not until day 29 that we get just over 50. But once over 50, boom, the whole thing is covered. Why do I show you this? Well, I suspect that some of you are thinking to yourself, well, Mr. Future Man, if the world's changing as fast as you say it is, how come my world feels pretty much the same? My message to you is these trends, these tools, these technologies have been doubling. What you have to appreciate we're just at day 20. The really big change is just ahead of us. This is what we are all preparing for. This is why we have to jump the curve, and it is this amount of change that's going to require a lot of unlearning on all our behalves. So I know I've just dropped a bomb on some of you. I just want some of you who are a little overwhelmed to take a deep breath with me here. And I want to remind you we've lived through this. And I'm going to prove it to you, and it should give you confidence that we're going to continue to live through these changes. So to do this, how many of you can remember the hit movie from 1987, Wall Street? Any of you remember that movie? So if you remember, Michael Douglas plays Gordon Gecko. He's this high-powered Wall Street guy. But to show he's a high-powered Wall Street tycoon 25 years ago, what device did they show him using in the movie? Can you remember? That's right. It is that brick-like cell phone. That bad boy was the Motorola Dynatec 8000X. Doesn't that just reek of power and prestige? And 25 years ago, it did. That device cost $5,000, and it only belonged to the elite. It belonged to less than one-tenth of one percent of the population. But let us fast forward a couple of years. Uh, this is just a few years ago. This is a real picture from an unemployment line on Wall Street. But if you look closely, what does every unemployed person have? 
Ah, but it's not just a cell phone, it's a smartphone. You can access the internet, you can social network, you can store every song you ever purchased if you want, you can produce a movie on it. And now with Siri, you can ask it all sorts of questions. So it is a demonstrably more powerful tool at a fraction of the cost and what has happened with mobile devices in just the last couple of years. Like that lily pad, they have exploded out, and this year, 2014, there are going to be more smartphones on the planet than there are people. That is extraordinary. My message to you is what you have to appreciate is all of those technologies I told you about earlier, the 3D printing, the genomics, the robotics, Think of them as all being at Michael Douglas's cell phone stage. Each and every one of them is only going to get better, faster, and more affordable. And as they do, they're going to explode out and transform the world around us. And for the entrepreneurs here, there is no shortage of opportunities to deliver better, more affordable health care, education, energy in ways that are hard to fathom today. Um, and let me just uh, wrap up with this. How many of you are familiar with this logo? Most of us see it every day or at least once a week. Could I just see a show of hands? How many of you have ever noticed the shape in the logo? Raise your hand. So about 10% of the audience. And uh, what is it, sir? The arrow, that's right. It's uh, staring you right in the eye. And if you can't see the arrow between the E and the X, Again, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. No, I can help you. Uh, there it is, in green. It's always been there. To me, this is yet another metaphor, and the metaphor is this. Every technology, tool, and trend I've told you about isn't off in the future. They're here today, and these trends are pointing the way towards the future, only that future isn't just linear. That arrow is shooting up exponentially. So become aware of these changes. Now, I suspect if I've done my job right, half of you are excited about the future, but half of you are quite nervous about how fast the world is changing around us. And I get that, and I appreciate that anxiety. But here, what's the best way to deal with that anxiety? Here it is. It's been said that the best way to predict the future is to do what? Is to create it your self. These trends, these tools, these, they're real and they're happening. But the future is not forecast for certain. It's only going to be created in the hands of entrepreneurs. And so with that, I hope all of you in this room do embrace this future to do what you want to do and to make this world a better place because there is no shortage of opportunity. So with that, I really appreciate your attention, and we will cut directly into the Q&A session. And we will, uh, we will start with this uh, gentleman right here. So we have two microphones working both sides of the room. <clears throat> with the growing pervasiveness of technology, how much more difficult will it be in the future to remain off the grid? So that's a, that's a great question. How difficult is it going to be to remain off the grid? It, it is, I, I'll be honest with you, it's going to become increasingly difficult to stay uh, off the grid. But I will tell you this, and, and I, this, is, this is one of the reasons why I think we have to embrace ambiguity. Uh, I mean, I am admittedly more optimistic than technolo about technology than many people are. But I think wherever there's a trend, there's also going to be a counter trend. And I think what's going to happen in the not too distant future is many people will start identifying themselves by the technologies they say no to. Just because we can have Google Glass or self-driven cars does not mean that we're all going to warm to these technologies. So I still think that there are going to be people who strive to get off the grid, and I think that there are going to be communities that actually cater to people who want to unplug and go to, for lack of a better term, uh, I suspect you, you must have some Amish and Mennonites uh, in this area. To me, they're a fascinating story because at some point, 150, 200 years ago, they said, we want off this technological train. The rest of society, you can do it, but we don't. We feel it's ripping apart our families and our society, and we want to say no to it. And I think we're going to see sort of a new trend along those lines when people say, look, I get I could do implantable technology to keep me healthy, but 
I don't want to, to do that. And I think, so that there are going to be some communities that strive to help people get disconnected. I, I just don't know. They're not going to be 100% disconnected, be my answer. Right here. Jeff, education and our approach to brick and mortar education. If we're looking at an 11-month-old that's already looking for interaction, can we bend that curve to possibly have a 16-year-old that's ready to go out and, and be this mental powerhouse that, that can change the world instead of waiting until 20, 25, whatever, whatever it is? I mean, if the technology becomes that inexpensive and we could drive a lot of the cost out of education, then that really doesn't bar anybody from getting that type of education. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more, and I think that many, both parents and people in the educational establishment, are going to have to do some unlearning, is that that is absolutely possible, and it's possible today. First, can I just see a show of hands? How many of you are familiar with Khan Academy? It's K-H-A-N. Uh, if you have uh, any student, I would argue, from four years of age, even up to college, become aware of this website uh, and this uh, Khan Academy because essentially they're making high quality educational content available online for free. Harvard, MIT, uh, is Wilkes part of uh, some uh, uh, massive open online course uh, initiatives? A lot of higher education institutions are already putting high quality content online for free. And the change that is taking place is in the past, Essentially, employers wanted that certificate of a four-year degree to say, oh, you have some basic knowledge. But in this new future, when your son could educate himself to extraordinary standards before he's 16, he might be able to go to an employer and say, no, I don't have a formal degree, but I can demonstrate what I know. And I think a lot of employers in the near future are going to say, I don't care where you got your degree, even if it was from Wilkes, as great as Wilkes, is what I want to know is can you demonstrate the knowledge and if they learned it online and increasingly they'll be able to, it's going to transform how we think about education. But I also, I don't want to, to leave people with the impression that there's no role for places like Wilk. That's also not true. Learning is still a social activity. It's, a, it's frequently a very local activity and I see roles for universities, because all of us, one of, one of the really big changes is we're going to have to unlearn the idea that education is something that only takes place from K through, you know, 20 or graduate school, and it really is lifelong learning, and we're going to need places to, to do it and to talk about it. So, uh, but to answer your question, absolutely, and the world will change, I think, along those lines. Uh, yes, sir. Jack, uh, thank you very much for a very stimulating and interesting presentation. Uh, question of Big Brother, the question of the technology getting closer and closer with metadata, et cetera. And NSA, perhaps you could comment on that. I do. I think that, um, well, first, uh, it's not just necessarily uh, Big Brother. I, I would argue that, uh, I mean, if George Orwell were alive today, he'd be absolutely astounded that we pay 30 to $100 a month to carry a device that essentially allows all sorts of people to track us. He would be flabbergasted at that. That's not Big Brother. That is, I mean, that's big corporation. Um, but uh, I think the dilemma is going to be that all of this data can, in fact, be used for beneficial purposes. It can be used to better help tailor educational courses to you. It can help you better understand your health, and it has beneficial uses, but of course it can also be used to, to violate your privacy and to encourage you to buy products that you don't need or want or anything like that, and I think that we as a society have to start thinking about how we deal with this. And there are a couple of ways that I think we're going to approach this big brother issue. And the first is, uh, it, it's happening, so, and we can't prevent it all. So one solution is we have to watch the watcher. We have to know who's watching us. I mean, I, I want to know what Facebook is doing with my dad or what Apple or Google or anyone else is doing, and today that's not necessarily the case. So the solution has to become 
the data, the de facto position on data has to be that the data is yours. And if a corporation wants it, they have to ask you for it. But that's not the default position today. They assume it's theirs, and then they make you go through all sorts of filters and screens to try and keep it private. So I think that you might see some legislative initiatives to try and tilt it back in our favor so that we can control the data and either share it if we want to or keep it private. Um, and, and then we have to know, again, who's watching us, whether it is Facebook or the NSA. So they're not perfect solutions, but I think they're better than what we have right now. Uh, yes? A lot of kids like my age are going to online schooling and they don't really have to like communicate with each other, like not in a class, no phys ed. Does technology affect how humans like interact and communicate? Oh, I, that's a really good question and the answer is it does, but we're not entirely sure how it does that. And again, here's where I think that we have to embrace some ambiguity. I, I think that in many cases, uh, we're moving, we're becoming too reliant on technology, so we're not having enough face-to-face -face interaction. I think a lot of people would agree that. But the flip side is online communication is allowing people with obscure interests here in uh, Wilkes-Barre to communicate with people on the other side of the world who they never would have been able to find even 10 years ago. And in many ways, it's helping some people, you know, engage in new forms of communication. So I think we just have to be um, careful of where we're going. And let me just, this is a great idea. This is a, what a university in my home state of Minnesota is doing. And maybe you do it here. Um, but when I was in college, we had the orientation week. Uh, now what a few universities are doing, they call it a disorientation week. And when freshmen come in, they take all of their electronics from them for the first week and they say, what you're going to do for this first week is first, just get to know that person inside your own head because you've never not had electronics. And secondly, you're actually going to meet your fellow classmates in a way that you haven't in the past. And I think it's a great uh, idea that, uh, again, I, I'm all in favor of technology, but I think that we can't just dismiss everything or embrace everything just because it's new, that there's a lot of, what are the figures? 90% of all communication actually takes place physically or sort of non-verbally. And so there's some forms of information that are just being lost in these mediums and we have to strike a happy balance would be my answer. Uh, oh, yes. Mr. Oldrich. Um, being a senior here at Wilkes graduating in a few months, I've been advised to go into technology. And um, obviously, you know, it's in Silicon Valley. So for me to become involved in it, do I have to go to the West Coast or can I stay East Coast? Is there something, some area developing here or is that not even going to matter in the future? I don't think it's going to matter in, in the, the future. One of the other trends I didn't even talk about is, I mean, one of the really interesting things about mobile technology, cloud computing, and that's a trend. If, you, if those of you are counting, I only had nine trends up there and I mentioned 10 at the beginning. The, the tenth one was cloud computing. What's interesting about all of those platforms is they're allowing entrepreneurs to do what they do virtually anywhere. You know, ten years ago, to start a company like WhatsApp, you would have needed to buy millions of dollars worth of computer servers, and you would have had to have a warehouse. But now they can rent all of that storage space for pennies on a, on a cloud computing platform, and they can do it from anywhere. And I think that we're already seeing some movement away from Silicon Valley to, to other areas. I think what a community needs, though, is some sort of curiosity and creative uh, intellectual energy just so that you have like-minded people to spring ideas off of. But I think that that can occur any place. So I think that geography is going to become increasingly less important in the future than it is today. And if you want to stay here in Wilkes-Barre, uh, and be an entrepreneur, you can absolutely do that. And in many ways, it might be a benefit because you're not getting twisted into all the groupthink that takes place in other places where they're all 
talking the same language and saying the same thing. Uh, yeah, this question does apply to the, uh, the invasiveness of this technology, potential for abuse, as we all know, and privacy rights, and people can manipulate, certain people with power can manipulate to maintain that power. So this question is, what do you think of Jesse Ventura and what's happened to him? What he claims has happened to him. You said, did say you know him, right? Well, I, I do. Uh, I don't, I've not followed closely uh, Jesse Ventura since he left the governor's office. I do know that he has, he has the, the TV show on uh, cable television about conspiracy theories, but I don't know if there's a specific incident that you're referring Yeah, well, <laughs> I can just tell you that, uh, so Jesse Ventura was an interesting character. In a previous career, I was a, uh, a naval intelligence officer, so the few times a year I would meet him, inevitably he would, and I was an intelligence officer, so he would, he would always ask me, Jack, he goes, well, what do you know about the Kennedy assassination? Like somehow, just because I was in the intelligence industry, that there was this grand government conspiracy. So he's always leaned towards uh, conspiracies, I myself do not share that same belief, and I, I think he's just a unique individual. But his, his point about privacy concerns are real. I think that you have them, and I, I think that your question I might be able to hint in that you have some legitimate concerns. So he, he's absolutely right to be wary, and to tell you the truth, I mean, the NSA and the federal government has not given us a great deal of reason to be confident that they really are watching out for our best interest in not violating our privacy. So he's right to be, we should all be skeptical, but I, I don't think we can afford to turn our skepticism into cynicism, that we should all be skeptical and then engage in the governmental process to protect our rights. Uh, this side of the room. And then we have, okay, time for one more question, and then as I, I'll be out there and I'm happy to entertain individual questions as long as you care to listen. Jack, you clearly have a handle on businesses and industry that's poised for exponential growth. So my question is, where are you investing your money? So, well, that's a, that's a good question. Here's, here's what I call, I call it uh, the 1% rule. And, and I sometimes give this presentation, is there any way that 1% can be greater than 75%? And if you know anything about math, you go, well, that's just not true. But I want you to go back to that lily pad analogy. On day 23, the lily pads cover just under 1% of the lake. But we're 75% of the way towards the end goal. And that's the mistake. So as an investor, I mean, I don't know if Bitcoin or hydrogen technology or any technology is going to take off, but I do look at these exponential trends, but as soon as they cross the 1% threshold, that tells me they're a lot closer to the end than most people expect. And so I kind of use that as a rule of thumb or a filter. But I will tell you that I think that there are promising companies in 3D printing, um, I, I, I'm not a financial advisor, so everyone do your own due diligence. Do not take my, if I was that successful, would I actually be here? No, I'd be down in Mexico with Jesse Ventura living the, living the good life. Uh, but uh, there are some really promising companies in 3D manufacturing. There's a company called Stratasys that I like. I look at the, the genomics field. That is poised to explode. There's a company called Foundational Medicine that I uh, like. Very risky, but high risk, high reward. But I do, I look at other robotics companies. So I do, I, I use both these trends and that lily pad analogy as sort of a rough filter. And um, so I, I'm happy to provide you some other areas where you can do your own due diligence. I can steer you in the direction. But uh, again, I appreciate all of your, your attention and I wish you all uh, the best of luck. Thank you, Jack, for a wonderful presentation. Before we move to the reception, let me share a couple of upcoming events. 
On Sunday, April 27th, the Max Rosen Lecture Series in Law and Humanities will present Senator Richard Lugar at 7.30 here in the Dart Theater. And the next Kirby Lecture will be on Thursday, October 9th at 7.30. Our guests will be Michael Reagan, son of President Ronald Reagan, Fox News Channel news commentator, and New York Times bestselling author and syndicated columnist. And now please join us in the large